Event Horizon, the novelization of the film by Stephen E. MacDonald. Chapter 23 Miller had gone so far as to issue an at-ease command, but even that edict would not overcome the tension and exhaustion in his crew. There was too much evidence of mayhem, too much debris, too much blood, too much of everything except time, air and answers. Weir was the exception amongst them. He had taken up a position at the briefing table, lounging there as though he hadn't a care in the world. Miller had expected the scientist to be falling apart by this point, given his earlier behaviour. It could be that Weir was simply comfortable on board the event horizon, but that discounted the gory, battered state of the spacecraft. Stark could barely sit still. Miller suspected that it was only the issue of their air supply that kept her from pacing about like a caged cat. Even so, she fidgeted constantly. More irritating was Cooper. He was bouncing the ball of his. Miller kept quiet about it. Better he'd do that than come up with something wilder. DJ, meanwhile, sat quiet, sometimes glancing over at Peters, who was staring out of the bridge windows, hiding her emotions as best she could. Miller turned to look at the video monitor. Smith was still working on the hull of the Lewis and Clark. Miller suspected that Smith could have been finished long ago. He just did not want to be back on board the event horizon. Miller turned away from the monitor and faced his crew. He took a deep breath, wondering if he could get them out of this mess. He trusted them to pull together, and he figured Weir would pitch in. But the circumstances were wretched, and the resources far too tight. Okay, people, he said, pitching his voice low enough to avoid being threatening while still maintaining authority. There's been a change in the mission. In less than 18 hours, we'll run out of breathable air. Our primary objective now is survival. That means we focus on repairing the Lewis and Clark and salvaging whatever will buy us more time. He looked around at his crew. We were staring at him, an unnerving focus. Peters had turned around from the bridge windows to listen to him. This was not new information, but he was gratified that they could still follow the protocols. Our secondary objective, he went on, is finding out what happened to this ship and its crew. Two months from now, I fully intend to be standing in front of the good admiral giving my report, and I'd like to have more than my dick in my hands. That brought a couple of weary smiles. No one was going to be cajoled, by cheap humour, however. DJ, take samples from these stains. Compare them to medical records. I want to know whose blood this is. Peters, I want you to go through the ship's log. See if we can't find some answers. Peters straightened up, nodding. I can use the station in medical. Keep an eye on Justin. Fine, Miller said. He looked at Stark. Stark, I want you to repeat the bio scan. Stark closed her eyes, sighing. I'll just get the same thing. Not acceptable, Miller snapped. He was not about to allow Stark to quit trying now. As good as any of them quit trying, that person was as good as dead. I want to know what's causing these readings. If the crew is dead, I want the bodies. I want them found. Stark sat for a few moments, thinking it through. Then she looked up at Miller, her expression determined. I can reconfigure the scan for C12, analyze proteins. Do it. Stark turned away, getting to work. Miller turned to the briefing table. Dr. Weir? Weir did not flinch away. Yes? One of my men is down. I want to know what happened to him. Cooper grabbed his ball out of the air with a loud smacking sound. I told you, the rescue tech said angrily. He was inside the core. Weir was shaking his head. The relaxed look lost now. The scientist looked confused. Just as he had looked confused when Cooper had tried to explain what had happened earlier. At that point, all they had on hand was chaos. Miller had hoped to get something more out of Weir during the briefing. Cooper was silent for a few moments. Weir said nothing, intent on Cooper. Miller nodded at Cooper, giving his assent for Cooper to continue. Cooper swallowed and tried to compose himself. It was like nothing was there. Cooper looked up at Miller, but found no cure for his helplessness there. No cure 
for his helplessness there. And then Joss had appeared and then it, it was like Cooper was becoming unfocused, trying to find his way back into memory, putting words to the clutter of images. Liquid. And then the ring started moving again and it flew solid. That's not physically possible, Weir snapped. Cooper stared at him, shocked at Weir's tone. Excuse me, Dr. Weir, you weren't there. So you don't talk to me about physics. Weir was set and determined. He leaned forward onto the table. Mr. Cooper, those rings only stop moving just before the gravity drive activates. If they weren't moving, that would mean the gateway was open. Then that's what I saw, Cooper said, interrupting Weir. The gateway was open. And the gateway can't have been open. Weir continued, ignoring Cooper. Because the gravity drive was not activated. Cooper turned to Miller, a desperate look on his face. Skipper, you're not going to listen to this fucking poo. It just can't turn on by itself. Weir snapped. Cooper turned angrily, rising from his seat. His right arm snapped back, forward, sending the ball at Weir's face. To Miller's surprise, the scientist stuck fast, the ball doing no more than ruffling his hair. The ball struck the rear bulkhead and crooned off the deck and back into the air. Cooper! Miller reached out and plucked the ball from the air. Cooper sat down heavily, boneless. Miller gave Weir a hard look. Dr. Weir, Justin may die. Whatever happened to him could happen to all of us. Weir hesitated for far too long. A pause that told Miller that the scientist was trying to sugarcoat the truth. Finally, Weir shrugged and said, Maybe Mr. Cooper saw an optical effect caused by... Weir frowned, hesitating again. Gravitational distortion. Cooper glared at Weir. His hands were clenched into fists. I know what I saw and it wasn't fucking optical effect. Mr. Cooper! Miller barked. Cooper subsided, glaring at Weir. This was all he needed, Cooper acting like Smith. He was faintly glad that Smith was elsewhere, working on the Lewis and Clark. Miller turned his attention to Weir, who was warily resuming his seat. Gravitational distortion? Weir hesitated for a moment, watching Cooper. His scrutiny made no difference in Cooper's attitude or posture. Reluctantly, he looked at Miller. If a burst of gravity waves escaped from the core, they could distort space-time. They could have made Justin seem to disappear. They could have also damaged Lewis and Clark. As far as Miller was concerned, there was something missing, something Weir was avoiding saying. What could have caused them? Weir was silent, staring helplessly at Miller. What's in the core? It's complicated. Weir trailed off, looking abashed at the weakness of his answer. How much time do you need? Miller said, taking several steps closer to Weir, leaning down on the briefing table, using his clenched fists for support. We have 17 hours and 42 minutes. Now, what is in the core? Weir was silent for too long. Miller began to consider less civil methods of getting information out of Weir. Suddenly, the scientist seemed to make a decision. Weir set forward, staring wildly at Miller. A black hole. We are set. Chapter 24 Miller and Stark stood at the end of the walkway into the second containment, watching the core uneasily. Neither of them trusted Weir's pet tinker toy. The rings were moving slowly, quietly, but the core itself had an eerie rippling effect, a sense of great dark power somehow confined to a small space. All around them, power hummed and sang at of enormous energies, Miller felt dwarfed in this space. Weir, by contrast, was at ease again, walking around the core, inspecting it, looking it over like a loving father. Miller almost expected him to reach out and pet the thing. Weir turned and looked up at them. When a star dies, it collapses in on itself, it becomes so dense that nothing can escape its gravity, not even light. It becomes a black hole. Stark was staring at the core, unwavering. 
the most destructive force in the universe, she whispered. And you created one. Yes, we said. He seemed infernally cheerful. We can use that power to fold space-time. Not as much power as we would have liked everyone to think. Miller reflected. He was ready to bet that Weir's call actually dealt with quantum black holes, as postulated in the work of Stephen Hawking and others in the last two decades of the 20th century. Given Weir's ability to produce one on cue and trap it within the core, there was enough power there to fold space-time nicely. It had been speculated that the 1907 Tunguska incident had been caused by a quantum black hole rather than a meteorite. Either way, we had a tiger by the tail in here. And he knew it. You arrogant son of a bitch, Miller thought. It would take the Lewis and Clark a thousand years to reach our closest star. The event horizon could be there in a day. Soto voice to Miller, Stark said. If it worked. We smiled. You can come down. It's perfectly safe. Miller and Stark discussed exchange looks, then walked down to the core. Everything in here, with the exception of the core itself, seemed to be coated with coolant. It gave Miller the uncomfortable feeling of walking willingly into the belly of a whale. Hello, my name is Jonah. I am an appetizer. Somewhere, the idea had lost its humorous edge. Miller and Stark stopped before the core, staring up at it, getting a closer look at the machinery as it moved around. Even at this close a range, the core played optical tricks. Miller felt vaguely sick. You let us board this ship, Miller said to Weir. And you didn't tell us? Weir turned to face Miller, folding his arms. My instructions were to brief you on the need-to-know basis. Given our current situation, you need to know. Miller stared at Weir, barely able to comprehend the man's attitude. I want this room sealed. The second containment is off limits. Weir was trying to stare Miller down, but it was not working. There's no danger. The black hole is contained behind three magnetic fields. It's under control. Under control? Miller growled. He waved an arm, pointing to somewhere out beyond the confines of the event horizon. My ship is in pieces. Justin is dying. Miller took a deep breath, trying to rein his temper in without success. No one goes near that thing. Miller turned around and started back up the walkway. Stark stared at Weir for a moment more, then she followed her captain. Weir watched them leave. Overhead, the power sang. Chapter 25 Peter squeezed her eyes shut and rubbed at her face, trying to blot out, for a moment at least, the tedious log visuals from the bridge flight recorder. Captain Kilpack and his crew had been me- meticulous about making log entries, but had not had much of consequence to record. She sat back, knowing she was starting to fade and growing angry at doing so. Even though she knew that was unreasonable, it would not have bothered her much if she had something to show Miller. There was nothing yet. Another structural status report, she sighed. The lights flickered. Startled, she looked up, but the lights had set it again. She looked back down at her screen. Behind her, something made a rustling sound, like something moving over paper. She turned around, slowly. Justin? Justin was still lying on the examination table, a sheet covering him. He had not moved or woken. Something had made that sound. The hairs rose on the back of her neck, and she felt her arms breaking out in goosebumps. Cautiously, she reached out and grasped a scalpel from the instrument tray that DJ had set out for further emergencies. The sound started again, became clearer, became the sound of someone scrabbling at plastic, trying to break through with nothing more than fingernails and determination. She stood up, walked past Justin, following the sound. The examination tables were covered in plastic sheeting, never having been readied for use. The plastic around the last table was moving, something writhing beneath it. Not certain why she was doing so, she reached out and grasped the edge of the plastic cover, 
pulling it back, needing to know what was under there. What was calling her? Danny. She gasped, suddenly weak, nervous. Nerveless. The scalpel slipped from her fingers, struck the deck, bounced with a tinny noise. Danny. He looked up at her from the table, his waist and legs still beneath the plastic. Looked up at her and giggled in the way that he had, amused at the world that insisted on being silly to his perspective. He reached up to her, and she remembered the vid she had been watching on the Lewis and Clark. She should pick him up, she thought. That's what Mum does, playing horsey. Mummy, Danny said, and he giggled again, as though he, as though this was just the best game in the world. His eyes shone, and she spilled over with love for him. She started to pull the plastic further back, knowing she had to get him out of from under there, and that they could figure out the explanations later. Then she saw what she had missed before, where Denny's atrophied legs should have been beneath the plastic. Something was squirming frantically, like a bag of angry snakes, the plastic pulsing up and down. Horrified, she dropped the plastic sheet, backing away. This could not have been Denny. Her son was on earth, with his father. Peters? She turned too fast, almost losing her balance. DJ was standing in the hatchway, holding a collection of blood sample containers in rubber-gloved hands. His usual mask had slipped a little, revealing concern. She turned back toward Denny. The table was empty. Her son, or whatever that... or whatever was masquerading as her son, was gone. She looked back at DJ again. What's wrong? he asked, putting the blood samples aside. I... Peter started. She hesitated, trying to clear her mind. The images were trying to fade, becoming elusive. She squeezed her eyes shut, shuddering. I'm very tired, that's all. It's nothing. She made her way back to the workstation, trying to focus on her work. It's nothing. Chapter 26 Right now, EVA was not precisely the thing Cooper wanted to do. Despite his earlier eagerness, if anything, he would have preferred being in the gravity couch, totally out of it, and well on the way back to Earth aboard the Lewis and Clark. This mission was totally, crazily out of hand. The one positive thing here was the size of the event horizon. That meant more airlock bays, which got around having the umbilicus in the way. The inner airlock door hissed open and Smith stepped into the bay, undogging his helmet and pulling it off. His hair was matted down, slick with sweat. You've been out there a long time, Cooper said, looking him over. Trying to beat my record? Smith sat down heavily on the bench, getting his gloves off. I'd rather spend the next 12 hours outside and another five minutes in this can. Cooper made a murmur with disgust. You don't need to tell me that. I put a lot of ops in my time, seen decompression, radiation, but what I saw today. Cooper trailed off, unable to answer any more. He could not push the images out of his mind, no matter how he tried. How's Justin? Smith asked, interrupting the silence. Cooper shook his head. Same. Smith opened his suit, then reached down to get his boots off. An EVA suit kept you alive, but makes you smell very, very bad in the process. Suddenly, Smith said, When I was a kid, my mother used to tell me that I was going to go to a bad place. And she was right. Smith's eyes were filled with a fervor that Cooper found more than a little spooky. This shit, it's crazy, you know? I mean, trying to go faster than light, that's like the Tower of Babel. You know what God did to the Tower of Babel, don't you? He cast it down. Cooper sighed, shaking his head. Smith, we got enough shit going on without you going biblical on me. Cooper picked up his helmet and put it on and sealed it. Hearing the hiss, without waiting for Smith to check him over, he walked over to the airlock, hit the door control and ducked through. All of a sudden, being outside had become very, very attractive. Chapter 
Chapter 27 Miller, DJ, and Weir had gathered behind Peters as she recalled the last entry in the Event Horizon log. She had found nothing useful so far. This is the final entry in the ship's log, she said, and pressed the play control. The video display cleared. Captain Kilpack appeared on the screen, sitting in the centre seat. He looked excited, as well as he should. This was the main event in the Event Horizon's maiden voyage. His crew, all 18 of them, were gathered around behind him. A few solemn faces, many smiles. Kilpack said, I want to say how proud I am of my crew. I like to name my station heads. Chris Chambers, Dennis Rubin, Dick Smith, Tom Fender, and Stacy Collins. We have reached a safe distance and are prepared to engage the gravity drive and open the gateway to Proxima Centauri. I wonder if they've made it, Miller said quietly. On the screen, Kilpack raised a hand to salute and said, Ave, Acu, Valet. Hail and farewell. Little did they know, Miller thought. There was a burst of static across the screen. At first, Miller thought the log disc had simply run its course, but then realised that it would have simply stopped playing, shutting off the system. There was something else on the disc. A terrible sound came pro- A terrible sound came pouring from the speakers, shrieking and inhuman, something out of the depths of their nightmares. Peters yelped and reached for the gain slider, cutting their racket down. To Miller, there was more than static on the screen. There was something moving inside the image. He reached out, tapping the pause control. He squinted at the screen, trying to resolve the image in the frozen frame. There was definitely something there, but he could not make it out at all now. Peters was squinting at the frame too. What is that? He asked her. Peters shook her head. I can run the image through a series of filters, try and clean it up. There was a chance that they might learn something useful from the scrambled section of the disc. Miller nodded. Proceed. Without warning, the lights faded out slowly. Emergency lighting came on, illuminating them with a dim reddish wash. A power drain, DJ said. Miller had to agree. Something had been activated. He had a terrible suspicion about the reason for the drain. The core! Weir snapped, turning to Miller. Go, Miller said. Weir ran for the door. The rest of you stay here, Miller said before DJ could head for the door. I don't want anyone else going near that thing. Miller took off after Weir. He caught up with the scientist halfway down the main corridor, surprised at how fast Weir was able to move. They ran together through the first containment and down the tunnel into the second containment, not waiting for the main door to open fully squeezing by as soon as they could. Not an easy trick for a man as tall and broad-shouldered as Miller. What's causing the drain? Miller asked, as Weir went over to the main console. The magnetic fields are holding, Weir said, examining the readouts. He shook his head, looking baffled. Maybe a short in this fail-safe circuit. I'll check it out. Weir turned away from the console and opened a wall panel. To Miller's surprise, there were tools and flashlights inside. We handed tools to Miller and waved him over to the access panel on the wall. They set to work silently, removing bolts and magnetic clamps. Behind the access panel was a cramped looking duct. Miller could see circuitry and modules inside as he bent down to look. The duct seemed to go on for quite a distance. He looked at Weir, dubious. I hope you know what you're doing. Of course, Weir said. To Miller, he sounded as though he believed it too. Miller handed him a flashlight and a small wrap toolkit. Weir tossed the flashlight and tools into the duct, then hauled himself inside. He almost filled the duct, but he seemed to have no trouble moving. Miller shook his head. Weir was a walking con- contradiction. Weir's boots vanished from sight. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been chapters 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27 of Event Horizon, the novelization by Stephen E. MacDonald. Once again, Liam is doing a great job, and I'm really enjoying this novelization. It's it's a little different to uh, sit back and listen to one of these instead of actually narrating it, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Liam, you're doing a great job, and I'm looking forward to uh, the the end of this book. Uh, I'm enjoying the story, and I'm curious to see 
how much of the stuff that was cut from the movie makes it into the novelization itself. I hope everybody else is enjoying this book. And, uh, you know, if you're a patron and you would like to be a guest uh, narrator at some point in the future on an audiobook on the channel, just let me know. Uh, $10 patrons and higher can uh, guest narrate either one upload or big chunks of a book. You just have to let me know that you're interested and we'll get something going. Uh, we'll be back very soon with more of this book. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood slasher librarian saying thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other, and we'll see you soon.